Good afternoon. Uh, I thought we were a lot more <laughs> of us out there. It, welcome to the side event on the occasion of the sixth intergovernmental technical working group on plant genetic resources. Uh, from on behalf of AFAO and AGP, I'm very pleased to say that this is our first opportunity to organize a side event in the event of an intertechnical, intergovernmental technical working group. So without much ado, I just wanted to hand over to my colleague Chikemba to carry forward today's events and introduce our speakers. We, have, we had great food and we have fabulous side event speeches and discussions coming up. Hope we'll all enjoy it. And we should be back in green room by 3 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kakoli, for that introduction. And uh, I reiterate her thanks and uh, welcome to, to us all who are braving it to participate in this side event. I, I, indeed, it is um, um, a star-studded panel, as you must have seen from the, um, from the flyer uh, in, in, your, in your packets advertising this side event. Basically, what we want to achieve is not to repeat the kind of messages that you have been hearing, but basically to use the perspectives of um, two important uh, partners in the areas of uh, plant genetic resources for food and agriculture and somehow um, enrich um, uh, the, uh, the perspectives that we bring to bear upon the work that we do. Now, there are going to be uh, two, um, two main uh, cohorts of, uh, of speeches. We will hear a presentation from the international treaty, and we will hear uh, another presentation from the CGIR consortium. Now, just uh, matters of housekeeping, I think it is better that we listen to all the presentations and then we take the questions. That way we are sure we are going to get to hear what everybody has to say. Um, the, the first uh, presentation uh, will be made by uh, uh, Dr. Shaquille Bati. And um, uh, Shaquille basically uh, requires no much of an introduction from us. Uh, but uh, just for reasons of uh, emphasis, he is the Secretary of the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. And as we are well aware, the objectives of the treaty is sustainable use and conservation of plant genetic resources. Again, just so we get some idea of uh, the kind of experience that he brings to bear upon his work in the treaty and that will shape the kind of presentation that he will be making. Um, being the first secretary of the treaty wasn't his first thing with the United Nations. He had um, worked um, uh, um, with WIPO uh, in Geneva, that is the World Intellectual Property Organization, where he was head of genetic resources, biotechnology, and associated traditional knowledge. Uh, Dr. Batty is an expert in intellectual property rights. He has a PhD from uh, the uh, Duke University in North Carolina, USA, and uh, he's actually pursuing a second PhD now in bioethics. So um, I, I, without uh, uh, delving into <laughs> the presentation per se, uh, I, I will uh, uh, ask you to welcome uh, Dr. Bati to the podium. Shakir, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chike, and good afternoon, and uh, welcome to this uh, side event that we have jointly organized with our colleagues in the AGP SEEDS team on the occasion of the Intergovernmental Technical Working Group. And indeed, I'd first like to thank uh, exactly my colleagues from the 
AGPC team, Kakoli, Chike, Stefano, and Ishan for having um, made this event uh, possible. Uh, I'd also, uh, it's really a great, great pleasure for me, and I'd like to thank um, Mr. Frank Rizbovan for joining us um, as uh, the CEO of the CGIAR for the first time um, at uh, such an event, and I'm, I'm particularly pleased that we were able to organize this uh, together today. I would just give you initially an overview of the recent uh, developments in the context of the International Treaty. Uh, you are, of course, deeply familiar, 99% uh, of you, with the treaty systems and the treaty's work, uh, being plant genetic resource experts. Uh, and therefore, based on that um, prior knowledge, I would like to briefly uh, give you some updates in three parts. First, on the norms and core systems and standards of the treaty and uh, their implementation, moving from standard setting and the treaty as a legal text to directly the implementation of its provisions in the field and uh, translating and creating pathways of impact from the legal instrument to the applied uh, technical work in the field. Um, this I'd like to illustrate in three areas, three such pathways, the multilateral system of access and benefit sharing, the benefit sharing mechanisms of the treaty in particular, the benefit sharing fund and some non-monetary benefit sharing uh, work, and conservation and sustainable use as the area we've been working on most recently. Then uh, a few words on the supporting components uh, and the collaborations that we have been building to uh, deliver impact and results there as well. And finally, uh, some uh, fi concluding reflections on the collaborations, including uh, very much with the CGIAR. So to give you a, a snapshot of the most recent results this year and last year, in the context of multilateral system, I'm pleased to say that uh, we have developed and now launched the uh, new online global information infrastructure and user interface that we have called Easy SMTA, uh, which should allow a very user-friendly uh, application of the standard material transfer agreement of the treaty, the private contract that facilitates the transfer of plant genetic resources from provider to recipient with both the facilitated access conditions of the treaty and the benefit sharing uh, conditions of the treaty as well. Uh, we will see that in a moment. We have also, I'm glad to say, just recently crossed the half a million mark of genetic uh, resource accessions that have been specifically documented in SMTA reporting data uh, that we have received and stored in the global data store of the multilateral system housed at the UN Information and Computing Center in Geneva. Uh, also, more recently, since the last governing body which requested contracting parties to explore and undertake measures to implement non-monetary benefit sharing, we have seen initiatives to implement uh, technology transfer, exchange of information and capacity building, particularly through a technology transfer platform uh, in the context of the MLS and the funding strategy. And of course, we have our intercessional committees. Uh, the Ad Hoc Advisory Committee on the SMTA has met twice this year. The Benefit Sharing Fund is, of course, the second area and core system. Here we have seen a more than tenfold increase in the project portfolio of benefit sharing projects that the Benefit Sharing Fund is implementing and has dispersed. Um, from the first round, which was a test round, to the second round, um, we have now uh, dispersed somewhere uh, around $5.5 .5 million in the current round and about half a million in the first. Uh, by now, there are about 100 organizations uh, in more than 36 countries working with the treaty uh, in this context. That includes NGOs, CBOs, farmers' organizations, national research institutes, uh, even uh, NARS, and uh, even also universities. The uh, Benefit Sharing Fund has also seen this year the largest ever inv single investment uh, by the European Commission of $5 million, and I'm extremely and profoundly grateful uh, to the European Commission for 
uh, having made this commitment and investment um, to the next round, the third round of the benefit sharing cycle. And we've also had, uh, which I'd like to highlight and uh, highly appreciate, uh, investments from new donors such as Germany, uh, Indonesia and others, um, which are of course of primary importance. The treaty has also made significant progress in its partnerships and that's one thing I would like to highlight today. Uh, since we are working very much in partnership with related processes and institutions from the Intergovernmental Technical Working Group of the Commission on Genetic Resources to the CGIAR, to the CBD, uh, and to other fora such as GFAR. Uh, and in particular, we have in the margins of the Rio Plus 20 Summit signed a new memorandum of understanding with UNEP, uh, which will uh, structure a lot of work that we will be doing on uh, the entire spectrum of plant genetic resources and plant agrobiodiversity uh, with UNEP and we launched a joint initiative with the CBD secretariat within the context of our already existing memorandum of cooperation that gives us a very uh, strong and direct framework of collaboration with the CBD. Uh, and all of that leads to significant progress, I would hope and believe, of recognition of the distinctiveness of plant genetic resources for food and agriculture, also in our in partners in the environmental sector. Uh, the, this year, the treaty also saw the adoption of the Rio Six Point Action Plan for the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources, which was adopted by those contracting parties that were present at the Rio Plus 20 Summit at the ministerial level. Uh, this is a uh, first, a larger, higher level um, articulation of a concrete action-oriented vision and plan uh, for the future directions of the treaty. It is not, of course, a governing body resolution, which I would like to highlight, um, but it constitutes a articulation by a number of contracting parties at, um, at that level. And uh, as I've already mentioned, we have entered into a new MOU with UNEP. The uh, treaty has also done an extensive amount of uh, collaboration, bridge building and connecting of different work programs and objectives in the FAO context where we have issued a information resource kit for FAO officers in the FAO regional offices so as to connect, as we said, norms with the field and uh, that will hopefully facilitate further implementation directly in your countries. Uh, we have also worked extensively with our colleagues on the C team in AGP uh, for the sustainable use program of work and toolkit or toolbox uh, on sustainable use uh, that was already referenced today and that work is now producing a lot of outcomes even just last week in the most recent meeting of the sustainable use committee of the treaty. Uh, let me just briefly then uh, illustrate these uh, linkages from the actual legal text of the treaty to the direct um, application and benefits of these standards, these legal norms in the field by uh, the countries. So in the case of the multilateral system on access and benefit sharing, we have part four of the treaty where now we will see in a moment the easy SMTA system is uh, being used widely and is making the SMTA uh, more and more accepted as a universal contract for the transfer of germplasm. And we have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, seen by now um, about half a million accessions documented, about 800 accessions every day being transferred worldwide uh, under the multilateral system in 127 contracting parties and beyond. Uh, this is just some um, visualization of the transfers under the system that we have uh, generated. I'd like to directly um, illustrate to you some of the work that has evolved quite a lot recently on the information systems that provide the backbone and the facilitation of the multilateral system from an original standalone CD-ROM based uh, software application named GeneIT. Uh, we developed a first online reporting system and that reporting system has now been upgraded to be more user friendly, uh, to be more easily accessible and also in all the UN languages uh, in the form of Easy SMTA. The system was developed with user feedback uh, and this includes very much uh, 
the administrators and uh, operators of gene bank database systems uh, in order to compile and automatically generate SMTAs in all the six languages of the treaty and to report automatically upon user request the SMTAs uh, to the global data store of the treaty. Here you see just the home page of that system. I would invite you uh, to visit it. Uh, and it's directly accessible from the treaty website, planttreaty.org. And uh, from there you can directly generate SMTAs yourselves. Uh, the ad hoc committee on the uh, SMTA and the multilateral system met just about a week ago and uh, moved forward quite significantly and quite importantly uh, the collaboration of the treaty with the CBD uh, in the area of access and benefit sharing uh, the committee itself, uh, by its terms of reference, as decided by the governing body, deals with user questions uh, and advises uh, the secretary and the secretariat on the questions that need to be, on the answers that need to be provided to users um, regarding the use and application of the SMTA. The membership is, of course, regionally balanced, appointed by the regions, and uh, it, the committee reports to the governing body uh, at its next session, and it has already held two meetings this year. Uh, it is an increasingly vibrant, interactive, dynamic, responsive process between the membership of the treaty who govern and manage the systems, the global gene pool, the multilateral system, and the users of the system who day to day, hour by hour, worldwide, use and access the system, and we are trying to facilitate a dialogue and an interaction and responsiveness to the users so that their needs can be addressed while always maintaining the governance and control of the contracting parties over the entire system. So the ad hoc committee with this particular task has um, provided several legal opinions and uh, advice. It first advised on the relationship of the multilateral system of access and benefit sharing of the treaty with the Nagoya Protocol uh, and domestic access and benefit sharing frameworks. Uh, it advised on possible further ABS developments where we're working directly with the CBD Secretariat as well. It considered, and uh, this is where I'm so pleased that we have um, Frank with us today from the CGIAR. It considered the CGIAR principles on intellectual assets and recommended future joint work in, in the development of implementing guidelines uh, that relate to uh, PGRFA also under development. Uh, it also advised on clarifications of the SMTA, uh, providing textual clarifications to some of the text which back in 2006 was still not entirely um, finalized and uh, clean, so to speak, and clear. And it advised on a number of technical issues such as cost recovery uh, from gene banks, um, transfer of genetic material for commercial sales, etc. cetera. The, uh, this is on the access side. Let me then come to the benefit sharing side, in particular the non-monetary benefit sharing mechanisms under the treaty. These, of course, are information uh, exchange, technology transfer, and capacity building. And back in 2009, uh, Norway and Indonesia hosted a global consultation in Bogor that considered these non-monetary benefit sharing mechanisms, provided a report to the governing body in Bali last year, the governing body adopted a resolution where it requests contracting parties to explore measures to implement non-monetary benefit sharing and to explore innovative solutions to provide predictable and sustainable contributions, uh, financial contributions to the benefit sharing fund of the treaty. In the meantime, following these uh, invitations, both contracting parties of the treaty and the other stakeholders like the private sector have taken their own initiatives to implement these requests. In particular, from the private sector side, Syngenta has built an online licensing platform and connected it to the benefit sharing fund of the treaty. Uh, this platform licenses native traits um, that are under patent titles and it basically um, then makes contributions from uh, royalty fees to, those, uh, to the benefit sharing fund. Secondly, Indonesia and Brazil launched a uh, workshop that 
uh, in, re in response to the governing body resolution, which brought together a number of working partners to develop and establish a uh, platform for co-development and transfer of technologies um, under the treaty. Um, the purpose of that is, of that mechanism or that initiative, is for the benefit of small-scale farmers in developing countries to facilitate the transfer not only of germplasm but also of technologies uh, that are relevant to PGRFA. Uh, the, those um, uh, contracting parties hosted a meeting, uh, as I mentioned, uh, a, a workshop that was held in, this, in August in, uh, at Embrapa in Brazil. Um, other working partners were the African Agricultural Technology Foundation, the National Innovation Foundation of India, Syngenta Wageningen and others. Um, it, they adopted a mission statement of the mechanism and are uh, now taking forward their own uh, initiative. This um, is guided by a number of principles such as a pluralistic and multi-faceted uh, approach to technology transfer always with the guiding principle of delivering benefits to farmers who conserve and sustainably use PGRFA. Uh, the, the platform would operate in the context of the funding strategy of the treaty. It would report uh, on progress to the governing body at its fifth session um, and, of course, future sessions. Uh, it will consult a wide range of stakeholders and, of course, always adhere to the treaty objectives. With that, let me come to the second of those three um, areas or pathways. Uh, first yes, was the multilateral system, second the benefit sharing portfolio of the benefit sharing fund. Uh, of course this is established under Article 19.3f of the treaty as a trust fund um, that is uh, under Article 18 directly uh, guided by the governing body of the treaty. Uh, this has now seen two rounds of, of the benefit sharing cycle that are already either completed or underway, uh, and we will for presumably foresee the third round of benefit sharing uh, to be uh, initiated next year. In the first round, uh, the donors were, and I would really like to acknowledge with great thanks, uh, the leading, spearheading, pioneering initiative of these countries uh, to have invested in a new mechanism at that time, Norway, Switzerland, Spain, and Italy, uh, with just half a million dollars, uh, we were able to fund 11 benefit sharing projects out of more than 400 pre-proposals that were submitted within six weeks of the call for proposals being open. Um, those 11 projects have now all been completed. Uh, the terminal report is just being prepared and will give an overview of how this entire project portfolio has contributed to conservation and sustainable use of PGRFA. The second project cycle uh, of the fund then commenced uh, after GB4. Uh, it has now dispersed about $5.5 million, which have been very generously contributed by Spain, Italy, Ireland, Australia, and IFAD. Um, and uh, again, these countries, by, through their commitment, were responding to an enormous uh, expression of interest and need from stakeholders around the world uh, where we again received between 340 and 400 uh, pre-proposals. And we now have uh, projects, as I mentioned, in all regions uh, within two windows uh, that we will see in a moment that are already underway to address those needs. The third round of the project cycle will include the contribution that I mentioned earlier from the European uh, Union, subject to co-funding, and uh, that will be decided by the governing body and its bureau in the next year. Here you see the actual project portfolio mapped onto the global map of uh, crop diversity, in particular the centers of origin uh, of crops, um, as you, the, the different projects from the different rounds and windows are different colors. As you will see, many of them are located directly in or near to <laughs> the centers of diversity, thereby always maximizing impact of conservation of uh, plant genetic diversity. This is the same projects uh, mapped onto the global hunger map, where uh, we can see that many are in the most food insecure regions, and uh, they are, of course, focused on, um, first and foremost, on maintaining food security. And here we see those projects uh, 
in the context of the diversity of vascular plants on a global scale. Again, as you can see, they're mostly in the dark regions where uh, conservation work can be most effective. Here, uh, a quick snapshot of the beneficiaries uh, who are benefiting from this uh, portfolio, who is being funded, as you can see, about 37% are non-governmental organizations, very often community-based, um, and 26% are national institutes, uh, governmental, uh, mostly governmental or non-governmental, and uh, after that, 21% are uh, international research institutes. The, that was all on the benefit sharing fund. The third area that I wanted to flag is the area of sustainable use. And here, the governing body had suggested at its fourth uh, session in its relevant resolution uh, the number of actions to be taken in this biennium. First, a stakeholder consultation, uh, then the development of a program of work on sustainable use for consideration at the next meeting. Uh, and the establishment of an ad hoc committee uh, to advise on the development of this uh, program of work and the toolbox on sustainable use, and that I already mentioned. Uh, I must uh, say that this committee has just met a, a week ago, uh, had a very productive meeting. Uh, it actually endorsed the core elements of a program of work, it approved the further development of the toolbox, both of which we have been developing with our colleagues in-house in AGP. And uh, it has now uh, foreseen that the stakeholder consultation will commence, and based on inputs from the stakeholder consultation and inputs regarding farmers' rights, uh, the program of work on sustainable use will be articulated and presented to the governing body. This is a very important uh, bridge and link with the supporting components of the treaty that have so far not received as much attention because we were uh, truly very busy with the startup of the core systems of the treaty that needed to be prioritized, that had to be focused on, that first and foremost, the multilateral system of access and benefit sharing, and then including its benefit sharing fund. Uh, this has taken place until now, good progress has been made, and now the supporting components, especially with the program on sustainable use, are, uh, are also now more uh, able to connect with the treaty system. Those are, of course, the Global Plan of Action, uh, the State of the World Report, and very importantly, uh, the partnerships that we have with the CGIAR centers, uh, the IARCs, uh, as well as PGR networks and the Global Information System on Plant Genetic Resources under Article 17. And you have been discussing these uh, the, several of these components, so no further uh, details needed. Uh, simply to say that the supporting components are in a way a pathway of making coherent the work on plant genetic resources between the normative work established in the treaty as the global legal instrument for PGRFA and the practical technical work that takes place uh, through the GPA, the State of the World Report, etc. Uh, this should lead if we can connect these things to more efficient and more effective uh, strengthening of national programs, developing strong information systems to monitor genetic diversity, enhancing capacity building both at national and regional levels, and building strong partnerships with other actors. I again uh, highlight our already existing partnership with the CGIAR. On collaborations, we have developed extensive collaborations in-house in FEO, uh, first and foremost, of course, with our colleagues in the AGP division, uh, in the seed team on sustainable use, uh, on the information systems, both views as well as the, uh, the, the NISMs, the national information systems, and uh, on the toolbox, as well as beyond AGP with the legal office on the SMTA and uh, farmers' rights, uh, right, rights-related work, with the right to food group, um, uh, on farmers' rights and with the globally important agricultural heritage systems team, uh, as well as, of course, first and foremost in the ABS area and other areas with the Commission uh, and uh, other parts of FAO. And finally, I'd like to conclude with the external collaborations. We have very close and direct collaboration with the CBD. We've held numerous joint 
capacity building workshops. Uh, we've shared the technical expertise of the treaty from implementing the multilateral system uh, with the CBD Secretariat in the context of our MOU. The new joint initiative has given further impetus to that. And of course, the CGIAR, I will not uh, preempt what Frank uh, will uh, present now, but I would just like to say that from the treaty side, these are very important agreements that the governing body has concluded with each and every CGIAR center under Article 15 of the treaty. And we are working now closely uh, with the consortium office uh, to give effect to those um, agreements and uh, through the facilitation of biodiversity. The Rio six-point action plan, uh, I will not uh, spend a lot of time on, but if you wish, uh, copies are available outside. Uh, they include um, just two points I would like to highlight here. Uh, one, to facilitate a new keystone-type dialogue to complete the governance of all plant genetic resources for food and agriculture under the international treaty. This was adopted by all the ministers of agriculture and environment who were present at the Rio Plus 20 summit uh, in June. This is a concrete action point to facilitate a new dialogue uh, to complete the governance of all PGRFA under the international treaty. Then the second point I'd like to highlight is that the countries the, and the ministers for the first time in a formal setting uh, also decided to explore the possibility of expanding the list of crops included in Annex 1 of the treaty. Uh, this too was uh, adopted uh, by consensus at that particular roundtable. And the two, the three uh, host governments, who I would like to thank and acknowledge, uh, Norway, Brazil and Italy, have uh, indicated that they are transmitting this to the governing body at its next session. And with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, pass over to Frank. Uh, thank you very much, Shaquille. Uh, please just note the questions and whatever comments that you have uh, directed to Shaquille and the treaty, and we'll take that after the, the next presentation, uh, which is um, uh, titled The Newly Reformed CGIAR, CGIAR Consortium with Special Emphasis on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture Related Research. Uh, this presentation is a, a double-barreled one that will be made by Dr. Frank Reisberman, that is the Chief Executive Officer of the CGIR Consortium, and uh, Dr. Stefan Weisse, that is the Deputy Director of Research at Bioversity International uh, here in Rome. Just uh, for, for reasons of a bit of uh, perspective, um, Dr. Reis Berman um, became the, the uh, CEO of uh, the CGIAR, uh, CGIAR Consortium um, just in May this year, and uh, I'm sure that um, a, a lot of people are keen, as I am uh, myself, in understanding what this new CGIAR is, but uh, it, it coordinates, amongst other things, uh, the activities of the 15 centers that make up the, the CGIAR and, of course, the donors that support them. Bioversity International is one of those centers. Again, just for reasons of perspective, Dr. Rice Berman um, has had a, a pretty much uh, uh, interesting career uh, in that before coming to the CGIR consortium office. He had worked in the uh, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He had also been director general of a CGIR center, the International Water Management Institute. Um, he's also taught in a university and uh, he holds a PhD, a multidisciplinary PhD in water resources planning and management and uh, civil engineering. Equally, um, equally well decorated is uh, Dr. Weisse, who is the Deputy Director General for Research at Bioversity International. Uh, before then, he had been a director in Bioversity also, and he had worked for several years as well 
at the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture in Ibadan, Nigeria, even though he worked in, in the whole uh, area of uh, West Africa. Uh, he holds a PhD in Agricultural Sciences from Eteha in uh, Zurich, Switzerland. So uh, this uh, double barrel presentation, Dr. Reis Berman will start and then will be followed by Dr. Weisse and subsequently we'll take all the questions and comments together. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can find my thing. So, as Shaquille said, 97% of you know the treaty. I think similarly, probably almost all of you will at least have heard of the CJR. In fact, before this meeting, I had a meeting of the FAO CJR working group, and afterwards, one participant said, well, you know, most of these people have actually worked at CJR centers before. So they know, and you probably know the CJR, but I would say you probably know the old CJR, and I would like to tell you about the new CJR. And myself, I left the CGIR in 2007, and I would have to say, at that time, if somebody would have told me that the system would have been reformed, I would have said, yeah, 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 I've heard that many times before. I wouldn't have put any money on the success of that reform, to be honest. Uh, and I think quite a few here in the room might be cynical like that as well. Well, when I came back uh, in 2012, I, of course, did a bit of homework before accepting this position. And, and I certainly think that this reform is for real and is here to stay. Uh, and I'd like to share some of that with you and see if I, I can't convince you if you aren't already. Of course, this reform is happening at the same time as food security back on the agenda for, in a way, rather sad reasons. But you know there are very important challenges. And I guess the challenge is uh, to the CGIR is the CGIR in its new form up to delivering on, on these new challenges. Uh, and while I started off saying that I'm, as an outsider in a way, coming into this job, was quite impressed with what has happened over the last few years in the reform, I would also be the first to say that you know, the last mile, the final steps of this reform, uh, are still uh, pretty important. So if you have critical questions on where the CGIR is today, I, I would share that with you, and I'll, I'll try and give you some impression of where we, we recognize that we still have quite a bit of homework before we can really deliver on uh, the promises of the reform. A lot of that has to do with some things that uh, you know, are a bit code. We use performance management system, and it has to do with you know, development outcomes, with, with better partnerships. And you know, I'll, I'll, I'll share some of these things with you, and I hope you can give us questions uh, uh, at the end as well. And Stefan will say a little bit more specifically about our research on, on genetic resources. So the, the CGIR in, let's say, 2008, pre-reform. Uh, you know, we talk about the CGIR system, but in practice, really, this was about 60 donors that came together once a year, but in the end, they went home and they made individual bilateral deals with centers. I mean, when I was a, a DG of one of the centers, people assumed we would get money out of this pot from the CGIR, but there really was no CGIR pot. You know, you had to sort of hustle in each of the capital and get bilateral projects, and each of the centers would do that sometimes in competition, of course, 15 independent centers who in the end, in 2008, were together implementing some 3,000 bilateral projects. 3,000. That's rather a lot. And the transaction cost of running after all those projects and writing all those proposals and having all the steering committees that go with each of those and doing all the reporting and all of that meant it was a quilt that I think it is easy to imagine that it's very difficult to give strategic direction to such a, you know, fragmented agenda. And in fact, I know you might, you know, I mean, the CGIR complained about not having enough money, and from the outside you'd say, well, you were actually pretty well off compared to many other organizations, which is true. But compared to the past, if you like, when the CGIR got 50, 60 percent of unrestricted support and was expected to do strategic research, that really had deteriorated, eroded to 27% or so in 2008, and with pretty high overhead cost, at something like 24%, you could see this, if you like, the unrestricted support barely covered the overheads, meaning there was very little space for strategic research. In essence, the system was mostly implementing a very large number of small 
bilateral projects. And funding had been stagnant for a pretty long time, which creates, as you all know, sort of a, well, frankly, defensive culture where people are worried about their jobs, where they're not that willing to partner or share resources. And, and that was the somewhat, you know, worrying situation in 2008. So where have we got to? Well, in fact, the donors, amazingly in a way, signed up for this CGIR fund and are putting large amounts of money through this fund, uh, and they are harmonizing, they're putting more core resources through that. And the centers did indeed sign up through a constitution that their boards had to agree to. So yes, they're still independent centers, but there is a significant uh, working together. You can now have a single agreement or contract with the CGIR as a system through the consortium rather than 15 separate deals. And the CGIR fund has only one relationship, it's with the consortium, and then the consortium uh, has a uh, performance contract with the centers. So there is, in fact, a very big change in our sort of legal structure, even though our cultural change that sort of has to catch up with that, uh, I would say, uh, will take a while before we really are, are implementing that. The very good news is that core support is actually going up, uh, back to some 35%, the slide says. Uh, latest figures are close to 40%. And because we've also worked pretty hard at reducing these overhead costs, they're coming down from 24 to more like 16%, meaning there is, again, some space from sort of core support for strategic programs to invest uh, in, in key research, not just implementing bilateral projects. And possibly the biggest win is indeed that the CG centers have created this portfolio of, we used to say, 15 CRPs, 15 research programs, plus, more recently, the Gene Bank CRP. We actually managed to sign the contract for that this morning with Paula Bramel, the Crop Diversity Trust. Uh, so we have 16 programs, and I know that if you look under the hood of those, you know, those are maybe not yet quite what you want them to be. I don't quite think that this portfolio is you know, the best, most strategic, most coherent program. But coming from 3,000 small projects, uh, it is a big step forward towards a much more coherent program, and as you'll see in sort of our, our next steps up, what we need to do, we'll focus a lot more on making that program much more and more coherent and having you know, much clearer outcomes, development outcomes for those that we can engage with partners, such as in this room, uh, on, on what we should be doing and how we can be held accountable. The very good news for us, but I think you know, also for key partners like FAO, the treaty, and, and many of our other partners, the donors are responding to two things, both to this increased uh, priority for food security, but we think also to this, this new structure of the CGIR. And funding, after decades of flat or re eroding uh, contributions, is sharply up, amazingly, in this very negative climate. So let me run through some things that maybe I don't need to spend too much time to with this audience. You all know that you know the food price spikes from 2007, 2008 are, are causing this, if I say it in elevator pitch, this increase in interest for, for food security. We sort of subscribe to sort of FAO's overall analysis. Here it still says 70% more food, more recently 60% more food by 2050. And of course we are much more aware that that has to happen uh, in a way that is sustainable, climate smart, you know, without wrecking the planet, however you want to say that. We often get questions and say, what is still the relevance of the CGIR? Isn't all the research on agriculture private? Isn't it done by Syngenta and Monsanto and so on? And we say, well, you know, if you're a corn farmer in Nebraska, probably Syngenta and Monsanto serve your needs. But as you know, in this room, we focus on smallholder farmers and a smallholder corn farmer in Africa has different diseases, different environmental constraints. They're often women. So, so this, if you like, is our overall very general focus sustainable intensification, uh, not just expanding land like the land grabs in Africa in response to increased food prices, but trying to find ways that uh, provide opportunities for smallholder farmers. That I think you all know. Now I'm using here a few examples from cereals, and of course immediately, as in the previous meeting, you'll say, hey, you're not talking about animals, you're not talking about all those other things that are important. But I'm using this as an example to say many people thought for decades that we were doing fine, right? I mean, crop yields are going up in a steady way, food prices are low, what's the worry? 
Well, one worry is that the steady increase of 40 to 60, per, 60 kilos per hectare for the key cereals uh, used to be some 3% over a low base in the 70s and has gone down to like a bit more than a percent. So realizing that if you like, population still grows exponentially, so this linear growth isn't enough, if you like. We're, we're running out of space there. On top of that, we're seeing stagnating yields. So there is an end to this nice incline now. Not everybody agrees on this, but certainly Ken Kassman, the, the chair of our Science and Partnership uh, Council, has a lot of papers that said, look, we are seeing stagnating yields. In addition, if you start to look at climate change, they're not only just stagnating, they may actually be declining uh, yield increases. Uh, that, in a way, is the challenge. You know, familiar ground for you. Of course, that means uh, the very first time I got introduced to the agenda of the CGIR by Ismail Sergeldin, and the chair of the CGIR, uh, he said, you know, we will increase the top yields, and then the yield gap is constant, and then we lift the poor farmers. That was sort of, I think, the old doctrine. Uh, today, I think we've changed quite a bit and say, look, we're not just pushing. There might still be some interest in pushing that top boundary of, you know, what area can grow uh, on its experimental station, you know, three crops a year of, of seven tons. But then that yield gap, realizing that the Filipino farmers just outside their gate under, you know, very similar conditions, also irrigated, same climate, same soils, get only two crops at four ton. You know, why can't we lift that yield gap? And if you then move to farmers under much worse conditions, no irrigation, no access to good uh, seeds, no extension, like rice farmers in Africa who get only one crop for two tons. So there's much more interest to focus on closing the yield gap, not assuming that it will stay constant and that we lift everybody. Uh, I'm not saying, in fact, that it's easy. In fact, it's pretty complicated. But it does provide you hope for those people that think that this is a scramble for natural resources and that we're running out of land or running out of water. I mean, the number of articles that says we're running out of water is so high. Well, if you look at the productivity of water, we can get like one or two kilos of cereals, again, that same example, per cubic meter of water. Uh, and in fact, in key basins from the Volta or the Impopo, farmers are getting maybe 0.1 or 0.2 kilos per cubic meter. And even in the better basins, like the Yellow River, they're getting only half a kilo per cubic meter meaning there is still tremendous scope to increase productivity of our resources. We're really not running out of natural resources. We need to use them more widely, wisely. And in fact, our environmental colleagues have realized that as well. And I think one very big shift I see is that environment and agriculture used to be very much on opposite sides of the fence. And today, many of our environmental colleagues have realized, in fact, they should be for in sustainable intensification as well, because that, in a way, is the only way to prevent this expanding footprint of agriculture that takes over our natural environment. I'm just giving you some reasons from, I mean, there are many external, very big and important trends, you know, the foresight trends, but, but from the inside, from the science agenda, why are we excited? Why are we, why do we think it's actually possible to make big changes in, in how, if you like, agriculture delivers on, on these challenges? And one is that You've all heard of molecular biology. I don't know how many of you are close to it, but I can tell you, like five years ago when I visited CG centers, everybody talked about the potential of molecular biology or marker-aided uh, breeding, molecular breeding. Now, just five years later, I've just visited some nine of the CG centers in the last few months. It's everywhere. People are doing it. It's become practice in just a few years. So there's a very big change in sort of the basic science in the heartland. Uh, in, in crop breeding, where what people do today is very different than what they did just a few years ago. And also in crop management, you know, that's the next thing. I mean, for a long time we've talked about the promise of IT. Uh, and, you know, as you all know, farmers do actually have mobile phones in their pockets. We see a lot of opportunity where actually technology will come to small-scale farmers and that precision agriculture, in a way, will, will reach and therefore change the way even our smallholder farmers that we are interested in do business. And finally, I think, I'm just mentioning three things, so, you know, not 12 as I could, but I, I just also wanted to push a little bit of attention for the fact that, in a way, we had sort of farming systems research in, what was it, the 70s or the 80s, uh, and then sort of gave that up as not a very fruitful avenue. I think we're coming back to that and say we need to look at farming systems that means not just looking at improved varieties, but at 
livelihood strategies, looking at farming systems, at communities, at access to markets, and a series of things that will change our perspective and our research agendas uh, quite a bit. Just to show you that our uh, agenda is different, I show this graph because you know, we all know that for a long time we had a hard time getting students to even consider agriculture. They all wanted to work in IT and dynamic sectors. And probably one characteristic that showed how IT was so exciting and so dynamic was Moore's law, that white line that says that every two years, you know, the number of transistors on a chip will double, the, the prices will fall, and what wasn't possible two years ago will be possible a few years from now. That, in a way, created that dynamism in that sector and got a lot of young people excited and everybody wanted to work there. Well, amazingly, the basic costs of sequencing, of sort of some of the core costs in, in molecular biology, are dropping even faster, is what you can see there, than Moore's law, meaning what was impossible two years ago is impossible today. What is a dream for two, three years from now is likely possible then, meaning the, the science, the research is changing so rapidly that we'd better, if you like, catch up with our institutional changes because if we take three to four or five years to change our strategies, we'll always be running behind you know, what, what science is, is able to do. So it's both an, a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. We, we see a lot of young people you know, the best and brightest minds that through this excitement in, in, in molecular biology and, and genetics that is just entering agriculture is willing to, to step up and, and, and join agriculture. Uh, and of course that's important because if we can't get the next generation to, you know, sort of engage, then, then we are in, 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 in serious trouble. As I think we see in many organizations that, you know, our best researchers are, you know, 50s or 60s and then there is nothing for quite a long time and hopefully now there is a new generation. All right, the CJR, we have a, a strategy and results framework. I don't know if you've read it. I mean, it says fairly generic things. It focuses on four areas. Uh, it is a strategy. It's not quite a results framework. So our donors approved it. But if you say, well, it doesn't really prioritize much, it doesn't really have good metrics, we'd agree with you. And in fact, that is our, our next step, putting in a way more teeth into this, uh, we just had a meeting in Punta del Este, and some of you might have been at GCARD, uh, and our business meetings, and our donors approved for us to, uh, if you like, go with this next round of SRF priority setting. So we do have an agenda that is a lot more than just cereals and a lot more than just rice, wheat, and maize, of course, right? I mean, uh, we had questions in the meeting. I just came in here and said, you know, what about animals? Well, we have a, a program on livestock and fish, not very large in here, and we probably don't quite have these balances quite right in a forward-looking portfolio. So actually looking at priority setting across our portfolio is a key exercise that we'll be engaged in, both for that system as a whole and at the CRP level, identifying development outcomes that we can be held accountable for. The new CGIR in some ways looks like the old CGIR. There is still something that we used to call the TAC, the Technical Advisory Committee. It's quite similar, still in this building, now called the Independent Science and Partnership Council. But there are also some new things. The fund I already mentioned wasn't there before, now sits as a multi-donor trust fund at the World Bank. Only two years of operation, but this year it will get a bit more than $500 million as a, a very big investment of donors in, in food security. The independent evaluation arrangement, that's new, set up here at FAO, and the first head of it has just been hired. The consortium, also new, as a if you like the umbrella or the, the single uh, international organization through which the 15 centers uh, can work together. And of course, uh, partners and stakeholders, many of which in the room here and that you know. So what is our remaining work? Well, first it is, we would recognize, I sometimes say more internally, a lot of our CRPs were somewhat constructed in the rear view mirror. We, we were sort of putting together everything we had which I hope you'll understand is sort of natural if you have 15 centers that have to create a new agenda. Naturally, everything has to sort of get in there. So our challenge is now to, to make them more forward-looking and not just to say, well, you know, we have five centers, they have to work together, how do we do this? But to say, if we have $100 million, what is the biggest bang for the buck? What is the biggest value for money in terms of development outcomes that we can deliver? And how do we engage not just the centers with each other, but with external partners, with CADAP, with the treaty, with FAO, to set an agenda that really meets the needs of the time, if you like, and delivers innovations that then are picked up by partners and brought to farmers. And indeed, on the partnership side, I would have to say, 
When you go to the centers, you'll see a lot of enthusiasm that the centers are much better at working together. See out in IITA on cassava, you know, see out uh, working in Latin America on cassava, IITA in Africa. They didn't really collaborate as much as they should have. Now they do a lot more. Still not as much with Embrapa as they maybe they should. Uh, meaning there's a lot more collaboration among centers. There is also quite a high expectation that we'll be better at partnership, partnering with people on the outside. And I would say that is still somewhat unfulfilled. We'll have to work quite a bit harder to actually make that happen. We know that and, and we will. That's the priority in, in years to come. So our funders told us, make your strategy and results for framework more, more dynamic, more forward looking, come up with better priority setting exercises uh, and have better metrics so that we can hold you accountable. So that is what we are going to do over the next year, more or less. We had our Science and Partnership Council write a white paper on priority setting. It's available if you're interested. That sort of specified a conceptual framework for how we do this, very much focused on development outcomes. And we'll, we'll go ahead and, and both do this prioritizing. I, I call it here top down, maybe I should have said, the demand side from our partners for research at the CGIR, for innovations that the CGR can, can deliver and the, the bottom-up or the, the supply side of, of what programs think they can actually offer in response to that demand. It will lead to a, a management update of our strategy and result framework in 2013. So this is what I, I told you. We, we are seeing a remarkable upswing in our funding uh, in a very difficult climate. Uh, a lot of the centers are growing very fast. Uh, I would have to say maybe we don't quite yet see what you would hope to see that people, when there is more money, will also open up and share more with partners. I mean, a lot of centers were under pressure for many years and, you know, we're always worried about firing staff and I think we are probably a bit too defensive still. But it's clear that if we want this pie to keep growing, the expectations from our investors and our partners is that we, we open up more and, and we should or we'll cut our nose, if you like. We are working hard also at reducing overhead costs, at becoming more efficient and effective. And when this was set as a target a few years ago that we should have overheads less than 15 percent, you know, 2 percent system cost and less than 13 percent per center, most centers said that that was impossible. In fact, we are getting pretty close now. So it's, there is some progress not just on effectiveness but also on efficiency. You know that we have these gene banks. Uh, we weren't always good in sort of maintaining them or finding funds for their operation. We're very happy that we have this collaboration with the Global Crop Diversity Trust that is raising an endowment, as you know, but that also is our partner to help, if you like, coordinate and manage this new program to which donors have now committed uh, some hundred million dollars for the collections we hold in trust uh, as a partner to FAO and working very closely with, with the treaty. You know that, you know, the, the total number of, uh, of accessions in our collections is maybe only 10 percent of all the gene banks. but we do like to present this graph that sort of shows that of all the flow of material, the, the CJR collections take a disproportionately large part. And that is, I'm not presenting this here so much as an accomplishment, but more as, in a way, a problem. We'd like to see much more material flowing uh, m among and between other partners. And in fact, we are quite worried from, from the CJR side that countries haven't quite yet really internalize the treaty and aren't quite yet using it to its full potential. And we are very interested in working with the treaty as a system to, to if you like, uh, get back to a situation where people feel confident that it's in their interest to share, uh, both internationally and among the members. All right, well, uh, I will not say much about the uh, genetic resources work because Stefan will do that. Let me just say, concluding, we think we we had a sort of a just-in-time already significant reform of the CGIR system. Uh, you know, it's a big cultural shift, so uh, it'll take a bit more time before we are really truly effective in that. I hope you'll give us a little bit of time, but we are also aware that this is urgent and that our partners will have very little patience with us if we aren't able to deliver pretty quickly. So we know that, we, we will do that, and we look forward to working more closely with many of you in this room and outside. Thank you.
Okay, good afternoon, and thank you for uh, giving up on your siesta time to be here. Um, also, I'm hogging the screen for myself, uh, so you won't see anything besides the consortium logo. No, I, I really want to keep this uh, short, and as uh, Frank has stressed, um, as part of the CGI reform process, we have created this, this, this single legal entity called the CGI Consortium that can now speak for and represent the centers collectively. Uh, we see this as a very positive development, which will, among, us, among other things, facilitate collective contributions uh, from the centers and, as appropriate and when appropriate, uh, from our research partners to these international processes, such as this one. As one of the members of the CGI Consortium, I'm very pleased to share the stage with Frank. Um, as the Consortium steps forward in this new way of doing business, we're part of this framework. And as we also remain committed to building on the Center's past involvement in and contributions to uh, the FAO programs, the Commission, the Treaty. So, uh, in a sense, Work uh, continues. I nevertheless want to take just a few moments to highlight some of the contributions of biodiversity and of the other centers overall to some of the agenda items that are being considered at this particular meeting. The centers have provided technical support to FAO and the Commission on Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture program of work including the development of gene bank standards um, for orthodox seeds, non-orthodox seeds, and vegetatively propagated uh, plants, which was endorsed by the Intergovernmental Technical Working Group yesterday. Inputs to the development of the indicators for monitoring the implementation of the second Global Plan of Action, as well as the preparation of the second State of the World Report on PGRFA. The work on indicators and the state of the world report is very relevant to our own work on better understanding the status and trends of uh, PG uh, RFA. Biodiversity can help carry out research to test the robustness of the indicators, for example, which are being proposed. Another important area of work um, where there can be collaboration with FAO is in the area of in situ conservation of crop wild relatives and on farm management. The committee has already heard about a technical workshop uh, earlier this week um, hosted by FAO concerning options for global coordination, information sharing, concerning in situ conservation and on farm management. The centers look forward to explore further engagement in developing this initiative. The centers have also contributed background studies that have been considered by the Commission and its working groups related to climate change and access and benefit sharing. In this context, we have made contributions concerning the impacts of climate change on countries' interdependence on genetic resources for food and agriculture, germplasm flows, and uses of germplasm in agricultural research and development, and the kinds of arrangements, both formal and informal, that have applied to transfers of these resources. The CGIR Consortium has prepared a report for this meeting concerning the most relevant PGRFA-related activities that all the centers are engaged in. More details concerning these activities uh, mentioned are available in that report. With that, short note, I would like to say thank you for this opportunity to highlight the contributions of biodiversity and our sister CGIF centers. And we will stay engaged as members of the CGI consortium. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Frank and Shaquille for this very elaborate presentation that uh, basically cut across the entire gamut of uh, the kind of things that we have been uh, discussing um, 
these past two days. Um, I do not intend to begin to uh, summarize these presentations because we don't have uh, that much time to, to finish here and get us back in the room by, by 3 p.m. But um, I think the, the main essence um, of holding this side event, which was to help us enrich our perspectives, especially with regard to, to the new things that are happening with these um, two important entities in relation to the work on PGRFA, have been largely actualized. Uh, Shaquille did give us the, the past, present, and future, if you may, of the, of the treaty, and I'm sure um, his presentation has clarified for a number of people how they may engage some more uh, with the treaty to the mutual benefit of uh, the countries and uh, FAO and uh, this normative organ. Um, itself. Um, uh, Frank's uh, um, presentation was also very illuminating, and uh, you are right in saying that uh, a number of us are alumni of the CGIAR, even though I began stuttering uh, trying to mention the CGIAR. I myself had spent five years working in one of those centers. And um, it, it is interesting, it is incredible just how much has happened uh, by way of uh, transformation uh, that has accompanied this reform in the CG, CGIAR. So I, I do hope that we also get the opportunity to learn some more, uh, both from the perspectives of partners to the CGIAR and hopefully people that may influence policies back home when issues relating to either the coordination of these 15 centers or the actual work of the centers get discussed. And uh, uh, for Stefan, indeed, I mean, Bioversity International is considered a valued partner uh, for uh, FAO, for uh, the normative organ, the, the treaty, and indeed for, for most of what we do. So it is a, it is a given that we'll continue to work together. So um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think we can take some questions and um, uh, try to get us back into the room uh, by, by, by 3 p.m. So just to make sure we're able to capture very well what uh, uh, what interventions each person makes. Please, when you need to um, make an intervention, just let us know your name and where you come from, which organization you, you represent. And if you may, write down uh, a summary of uh, what the intervention is. Okay, I see two hands up. Um, practical action first. You, Hungary, Miss Hungary, and uh, Miss Poland. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, and, and well done for remembering the name. Um, uh, it's, practical, it's, an, it's an NGO that uh, works from the UK, been um, quite involved in the the CGIR and, and, and all of this work in, uh, over, over many years. Really appreciated the, the presentations and uh, want to catch up with Shaquille on the, the, um, the technologies that will be transferred for the benefit of the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. It's a subject we've really touched on often. And, and, and Frank, and I, I really appreciate the, the presentation of the new CGIR. Um, I was quite involved in the old CGIR at, at one point and, um, and one of the features of the old CGIR was that it really had a big focus on the global commons, on, 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 on common goods, uh, on, on supporting um, those that uh, were, were, were um, particularly uh, uh, producing and, and developing biodiversity on, on farm uh, in situ and so forth. And, and so I'm, I'm quite interested in how in the, the new CGIR uh, that area of work is, is being uh, developed. It's not highlighted in your slides, and, and particularly, you know, how that work on agricultural biodiversity, uh, which cuts really across all of the, the, the work you're doing, how that's going to be resourced and, and how that's going to be able to um, dominate 
as we argued back in the, uh, the early 2000s, how that should dominate uh, the work of the CGIR. Thank you very much. I'm Ditta Gregus from the Hungarian Ministry of uh, Rural Development. And I'd like to thank, first of all, all the three uh, presentations. They were really informative, and I think we learned a lot. Um, I would have uh, uh, two questions related to the international treaty. Uh, we have heard from uh, um, Dr. Shakil Bhatti that uh, uh, f if I'm not mistaken, 500,000 uh, accessions have been given to uh, programs. And uh, I would be interested uh, whether uh, there is uh, information, what kind of uh, institutions, what type of institutions are, are using uh, these accessions and whether the, I don't know, maybe the top 10 or top 20 users of these accessions um, are um, available somewhere on the internet. And uh, my other question would relate to the uh, benefit sharing uh, fund. We have heard that um, there uh, has been huge um, amounts of money going from donors uh, to the fund, which is uh, really good. Uh, what I would be interested in is uh, whether um, money already uh, goes from uh, real benefit sharing, so when, when uh, accessions are uh, used uh, by users, um, has there been any um, benefit sharing uh, happening uh, in this field? Thank you very much. Zofia Bulinska Radomska, I am a national coordinator for plant genetic resources. I am plant breeding and acclimatization institute employee. The question is to Dr. Shakil, and uh, you may be astonished with this question, but I would like I explain why. I would like you to el elaborate a little bit more on the cooperation between uh, FAO, AGP division, and the secretariat. Um, why uh, on the com uh, com complementarity of uh, this uh, two organizations with regard uh, to, um, um, uh, for the benefit of uh, genetic resources, uh, or, uh, plant genetic resources for food and agriculture with regard to um, food security agriculture and, uh, and sustain, sustainable agriculture and nutrition. Uh, I'm asking you this question because I think there is some misunderstanding and uh, with regard to importance of uh, this uh, synergy between these two institutions and the level of complementarity of activities. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Just pass the microphone to Ms. Jamaica, and then we'll revert to the, <laughs> to the table. Thank you. I am indeed Ms. Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a couple of comments and also questions. First of all, to the treaty. Having my country, having just recently passed legislation in the lower house as it relates to um, plant genetic resources, what is the process of engagement and, well, do you know, sometimes it's difficult to get the correct information across ministries back home. So I'd, I'd like to be the agent to transfer this information to the government. So what is the process of engagement and where are we at? And secondly, to the uh, CGIAR, uh, we have several interests. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm the head of my research and development division in the, in the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries back home. And we have, based on your presentation, sirs, we are um, very much interested and, and our, our curiosity is, is, is piqued um, as it relates to several things. We have a priority development program relating to improvement of our plant genetic resources specifically in the context of climate change and the peculiarities of our 
tiny island. Um, so further information or, or, or interest specifically at relating to the, the life sciences revolution um, in molecular biology, what, what would you recommend or, or suggest further as it relates to um, particularly molecular markers for marker-aided selection for us? And um, just two other things. We, we would love to get a copy. I'm not so sure if anybody has an electronic version or, or, or hard copy I could take back home. The white paper on science and partnership, or if, if that's what you said, science and something. I meant I've gotten the word correctly. As well as in the context of the fact that, you know, as, as we are aware, the framework for R&D funding, generally speaking, whether it is for science and technology or agriculture, um, specifically as a sector, it is, it is um, well, the trend, certainly in my country and where I come from in the, in the region, we have had significant constraints um, as it relates to public funding and we have not necessarily been able to access private funding, well, certainly not from our region. Um, so we are very glad to note that somewhere out there, there is an upswing in the trend relating to funding of agricultural research. Um, because of the dilemma that is facing us now, we would be very grateful for you to elaborate further on any specific lessons learned as it relates to, to that, because we are very much interested in tapping into an appropriate approach to ensure that we are able to deliver on our research for development activities. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, um, Frank and uh, Stefan. If you may start, then um, Shaquille will take over. products for the global commons or global public goods. We do realize we have to work with the private sector, sometimes getting some of their technology under uh, specific conditions, which aren't always public goods, and sometimes working with seed companies that actually are delivery mechanisms to get innovations to farmers. So we have, since March of this year, uh, CGIR-wide intellectual asset principles, which are still primarily based on, if you like, uh, at least global access, primarily global public goods, but it offers an opportunity under specific conditions to do licensing uh, where centers argue that that is in, uh, if you like, in the public interest. Uh, and it was those same intellectual asset principles that, uh, that we shared with uh, and indeed put in front of the committee of, of the treaty and that we are currently working out the guidelines. Uh, we were certainly very pleased that on this subject, which is so controversial and where many of our stakeholders have such different views, we were able to come up with, if you like, widely endorsed principles that we think are, are a way forward for implementing some, some practical action uh, in this area. Uh, yes, our strength over the past has, has of course, been much more in ex situ conservation, the gene banks. Uh, biodiversity particularly has developed more of the approach on in situ uh, biodiversity conservation. You may be aware that Biodiversity proposed a separate program as part of this overall agenda, uh, which was rejected by our donors, and a number of our partners therefore say, does that mean in situ biodiversity conservation is not important? Uh, in fact, strangely enough, we, we would argue the opposite. People felt it is too important to leave it to one separate program, but it's one of the areas of interest that we feel need to be mainstreamed, like gender research and other topic that we think is critical for all the programs. So we are working on a consortium-wide approach for in situ agrobiodiversity conservation uh, and research. We had a workshop in July in which uh, many of our centers and the commission from here and the treaty also participated. And we are working on, haven't quite finished, a paper that describes our emerging strategy in this area. And we expect that each of our CRPs will be mainstreaming that work. So work in progress, definitely high priority, uh, and so to speak, uh, look uh, for, if you like, developments in this space. Well, I, I don't have time to quite go into all your questions, ma'am. Uh, the white paper can certainly be shared. I mean, it is on our websites, but we can also make that available through the treaty or through the, the commission here, technical committee. Uh, 
specifically on trends in funding for ag for development. IFPRI has a pretty interesting database, the ASTI database, that shows you trends in funding in, in agriculture for research and development. Uh, the, the upswing that we see, we'd have to say, is very much focused on Africa and South Asia. That's reality. It focuses on where the largest concentrations of, of poor people live. But we do also have good discussions with AICA, for instance, to say how we can coordinate better with national priorities in, in Latin America and, and the Caribbean. So that, I think, is a, is a way to engage for us in, in aligning the CGIR priorities with, with the priorities of, of, of national actors like yourself. Maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that to have a bit of space for others to add. Yeah, I, just to compliment as a biversity being, you know, as a member of the uh, and a partner within the CGIR consortium, uh, we have reviewed our uh, agenda along the lines of, uh, you know, what is the role we as a research uh, institute should play in terms of uh, agriculture biodiversity moving forward. And clearly we have re-emphasized, based on other studies that have been done by FAO and others, uh, uh, on, on the importance of the use and therefore linked to that the conservation of agriculture biodiversity use in terms of addressing livelihoods issues, food security issues, uh, in terms of resilience of systems, climate change obviously is one that pops up in that context, in terms of sustainability of systems, in terms of uh, also nutrition, which we often tend to forget. So. So looking at all of these areas, we see, together with others, that uh, agriculture biodiversity will play increasingly an important role. And so also as we develop conservation uh, tools and methods, we need to look at what are these approaches, what are these tools, uh, what are the institutional frameworks that need to be in place, what are the policies that we need to look at. Focus has been a lot on ex situ. We need to move more into the in situ framework, both on farm and, and in, in the wild. At the same time, looking at information systems, how do we also use traditional knowledge? How do we protect traditional knowledge? Who has access to that? So there are all sorts of questions that arise that we still haven't addressed, but we have a strong basis to build on. Specifically then, in terms of the, the life uh, science revolution, maybe just one quick point, because we are clearly running out of time, uh, is, um, an example we have been actually uh, talking to Frank about the, earlier this week is the DNA barcoding when it comes to, to timber trade uh, and the capacity and capability we now have to actually say where, from which area is this timber tree coming from and that can be tested and linked back to an area, is this legal or illegal logging? So we have all sorts of new tools that are now starting to become available that we can actually start applying in this field that we need to look into this much further. But it, it's, it's, it's huge in terms of uh, opportunities. Leave it at that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Shaquille, there's plenty, but if you can make it really snappy. Yes, thank okay. you, Chiki, indeed. And as uh, you just mentioned, we're actually running out of time with the working group, so I'll be very, very concise uh, to the four questions and, um, that, and maybe in the order in which you've asked, uh, Patrick, I'd be very happy uh, to discuss about the technologies there, just to say that at a very early stage, so it's all still relatively open, but I look forward to, to discussing further. Uh, our colleague from Hungary who had asked, indeed, thank you, about the two aspects, uh, the, five, the sort of half a million accessions, 500,000 accessions, I should uh, specify, those <coughs> were the SMTA reports or the, the SMTA reporting data uh, that were uh, s provided, submitted to the data store of the treaty. Um, those are not... Uh, necessarily inclusions per se, we have a separate procedure for notification of inclusions, uh, but de facto by transferring material under an SMTA it is included in the multilateral system legally. Um, and uh, these are the ones uh, which were actually reported uh, to the data store. So that's, and uh, related to that, yes, this will also allow us, and this is one of the great value added uh, elements of that system, this will allow us to uh, produce aggregate reports, statistical reports, uh, on which percentages of institutions are providing, receiving, uh, and also uh, perhaps provide a sort of a list of the top 10, 20 users. Uh, we are still in the process of preparing those for the next governing body session, but that type of data will be available. 
Your second question, very briefly, on uh, strict or sensu benefit sharing uh, in the sense of mandatory payments under the SMTA uh, to the benefit sharing fund. Uh, there have not yet been uh, mandatory payments, but there have been voluntary germplasm transfer based payments, uh, one in particular, uh, from uh, a triticale line that was uh, made available under the MLS and led to a product which was then, uh, there was a voluntary contribution. But it is indeed a very naturally long and lengthy process, obviously, uh, until uh, finally products result from the germplasm that was accessed. So there's a long time lag there. And uh, to be brief, um, our colleague uh, from Poland, and thank you very much for your question, Regarding the complementarity between the work of the treaty and the FEO technical units in particular in AGP, uh, this complementarity is something that has, we've been developing very much as we have started up the treaty systems. We've also been building and increasing and elaborating this complementarity very much over the past three years or so, and it has uh, three levels. Um, the first is at the level of governance. And here we have to be very clear that there are two distinct governance frameworks. The governing body of the treaty adopts its own work program, budget, and so on. And then, of course, we have uh, the work, uh, the governing bodies that adopt the regular program work of the organization. Um, the second level is at the level of the work programs and various vehicles for that and structures, uh, such as the Global Plan of Action, the Program of Work on Sustainable Use that we just heard about, which are now increasingly connected, um, the national information systems uh, and the information system of the multilateral system uh, that are increasingly connected, uh, the benefit sharing fund and the implementation of the projects for benefit sharing, which are increasingly we are connecting, and these different areas as the treaty systems are evolving and as we have been able to start them up, we've also been building and developing this complementarity. And a lot of work has gone and is continuing to go into that to even further strengthen that. It's maybe sometimes not so visible, but uh, that is very much work that is ongoing and, and in progress. And the third level is at the practical operational cooperation level where we have regular meetings, um, you know, on a very regular basis in-house, but that's very, very practical for us in terms of the implementation. Uh, then our colleague from Jamaica, um, the question on uh, the recently adopted ABS legislation, and of course, Jamaica, you are a uh, contracting party since 2006, uh, and as such, uh, we just recently held a workshop or participated in a workshop in the Caribbean uh, precisely relating to these issues about synchronization between uh, CBD type uh, access and benefit sharing legislation and implementation of the treaty with the multilateral system. And I'd be very happy uh, to provide you that material as well as uh, for you to be, uh, so to speak, the relay or agent of the transmission and coordination of that, uh, of those different implementation tracks uh, to uh, connect you also with the national focal point, our national focal point, and the joint capacity building program that we have. That's uh, all to be concise. Thank you. Thank you very much um, indeed. Uh, the time is our problem here, but let us not rise before uh, putting our hands together for this. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. And there are a number of colleagues here that made uh, this meeting possible uh, from both the treaty and the technical unit. There is Francisco here, there is Asia, there is Eshan, uh, I saw Paola, and uh, several other colleagues. So put your hands together for them also. Thank you. And we, let's just uh, go straight back and the panelists are very accessible. You may continue the discussions afterwards. Yes, unfortunately, exactly right. Exactly.